it's time to answer the question, can CH live up to their reputation, starting with the CH fighter stick? First, a recap for anyone new to the channel on how we do reviews. I'm going to go into a lot of detail, and I hope you will come out feeling like you have used the product yourself and will know if it is right for you. I will not be giving a buy or not buy recommendation. I will tell you how I like it at the end, but you could feel differently based on the things that are important to you. So pay more attention to the review than the conclusion. Also, before we start, I want to be explicit about what is being reviewed today. I am only reviewing the CH Fighter Stick. I will be doing separate reviews on the Pro Throttle and the Pro Pedals. I will also do a separate review on the CH Control Manager software. The software is simply too deep to mix into this review, and it isn't specific to just the Fighter Stick because it works for all CH products. I don't want to have to go into the same review of the software when I do the Pro Pedals and then do it a third time when I do the uh, Pro Throttle. But we will briefly touch on the software capabilities today. I'm just not going to go into depth. Keep in mind that review will be coming though. Finally, I will end the CH series with a review of the whole CH ecosystem working together. That's the fighter stick, the throttle, the pedals, and the software. So let's get started. Here we have the box and all of its contents which is the fighter stick itself and a tiny instruction manual. There's nothing else in there. It's packaged with cardboard to support it. Uh, it's nothing fancy. It doesn't really need anything fancy. It feels pretty sturdy. The plastic is pretty tough and it's pretty light too. You know, for some products like, you know, say the Warthog, it's so heavy that you feel like the weight would break something if you were to drop it badly. Uh, on the other end, there's plastics they're just really cheap flimsy abs that feel like that's going to break this is somewhere in the middle um pretty tough uh, i don't think that there'd be any issues with it breaking during shipping the msrp on amazon is about 125 dollars i paid 75 dollars for this brand new and with warranty so if you're going to get one be sure to look around for deals you can find plenty of deals on ch stuff uh, and you can save a lot of money on the uh, full setup, especially if you're going to get all three of these items. The way that I've tested this is I've tested it with the Pro Throttle and the Pro Pedals and the CH Control Manager software. And intermittently, I've thrown in different pedals and different throttles as well. The warranty is a two-year limited warranty. Normally, that's all I have to say about the warranty. I'll just mention that it's a two-year limited warranty, blah, 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 and we're done but CH has forced my hand. Just in case you can't read that, I'll read it for you. It says, fuck you. Fuck you. That's what CH is saying to you with that sticker. That's what any manufacturer who puts those stickers on their products are saying to you. In the US, federal law, and FTC regulations prohibit a manufacturer from voiding a warranty because you performed your own maintenance on a product. So this sticker has no effect whatsoever. Your warranty is not voided by breaking this sticker. Feel free to destroy it, just like I did. If you damage something while working inside the product, the manufacturer does not have to cover the damage that you caused, but any manufacturer defects in the, the product are still covered. That's the law in the U.S. CH cannot get out of that. If they try to trick you, if they try to refuse service to you because that sticker is broken, sue them. And from what I hear, that's true in the EU as well with the two-year statutory warranty. I, I don't know the details of EU law, but that's what I've heard. So shame on you, CH, for trying to lie to your customers and trick them out of getting their warranty service. Okay. So that's what you get. Let's see how it performs. As always, we will start with the look and feel because the first thing you do with any product is you pick it up and you look at it. The first impressions, um, I like it. The look is professional, understated. I like the matte black with the gray and red button accents. It looks vaguely like a real 
flight stick. Thank God they kept it simple. You know, the, the last review that we did, the X-56, that kind of looked like someone swallowed radium and then vomited all over it. There's no stupid designs and paint jobs or anything like that. They kept it nice and simple. On closer inspection, though, you start to see the signs of the age of the product. The, the CH product line has not seen significant updating in two decades now. And the styling really betrays that. So if we look at the lines across the bottom, they, they just look really old fashioned, as do the bevels along the edge. They're just very, very large. It's not what you typically see in a contemporary design. And then the LEDs, which display the current mode, they're like big bulbous things. They're not like the sleek modern LEDs you find on electronics these days. They look like the LEDs that you get included in a child's breadboard kit. I mean, like this is just the, the cheapest stuff that you, you get to just play with electronics. It's, it's not what you typically expect to see these days in something that's professionally built. The surface texture is very rough. Well, I shouldn't say very rough, but it is rough. It's not like a nice soft touch finish or smooth. I'd prefer this over something that's simply smooth, but not over something that's soft touch. But the issue I have with that is it makes it feel kind of toy-like. The surface texture, it's, it's almost like what you expect from plastic toys that you would find in a pediatrician's waiting room. But I don't hate this. Um, I actually like it for the most part. It just needs some updating on the details. The big picture styling looks good. It's just those little things that, the, that finish it off that I think could use some changes. I don't consider aesthetics to be that important personally. I usually play in VR anyway, so I don't even see it. Even if I'm not, you know, I, I care more about the functionality. The feel of the product is mostly good, aside from that rough texture. You know, a soft touch finish would be appreciated. Ergonomically, it's pretty good. I can reach all of the buttons quite well. I do have a couple of small ergonomic issues though. The first is that the hand rest is too small. And if I actually put weight on it, my hand wants to kind of fall off the side. And you can kind of see how it doesn't fully support my whole hand. The other issue is this pinky button. And the issue with the pinky button is simply that its position and the fact that it requires very low actuation force makes it very easy to accidentally press. So what happens is when I'm using the buttons up here, you know, I start with my thumb here, and then you want to go up here, you want to rotate your hand. And when I do that, I start accidentally hitting the pinky switch because it's just, it's very easy to actuate with very little force. I think that could have been fixed in a number of ways. Um, if it were off center, like the Warthog's grip, uh, that would help. If it were raised just a little bit, like on the Cougar grip, that would help. Or if it just required more force, I think that would help as well. However, I do consider both of those to be kind of nitpicking issues. Most of the time you're not resting your hand on the hand rest. And I pretty quickly got used to the uh, actuation force on the pinky button and moving my thumb properly without activating it. So overall, my personal opinion, I give it a C plus for looks and uh, an A minus for feel. So let's take a look at how the joystick works. First, a word on how I'm going to be displaying this. In our X56 review, I used a handful of basic apps to do this, but nothing really did what I wanted. DI view came closest, but it's a long dead project, it's not open source, and the UI is terrible. 
So I made my own. Uh, welcome to the Charmed Baryon joystick suite, or rather an early build of it. Eventually this will be released and open sourced. It's still early in development, but already does everything any other testing app would do and more. So I'm using it. To explain what you are seeing here, we have a list of axes and for each one we show the HID input on top and the direct input on the bottom. Note that the raw HID input is uncalibrated, so the fact that things don't look centered there is fine. We also have a list of hat switches. Those are POV hats, not just the four-way button hats. And that lets us show the angle that's being pressed. And we show all of the buttons that are available. On the right, we have an assortment of test for the axes that I hope to eventually run through in every review I do. However, these are not ready for today, so we'll be testing everything by hand. And finally, we have an event log similar to what DIView has, which just shows you that buttons were pressed. I can also select axes or hat switches and see their details on the left properties panel. So for example, there is our Y axis. I can see the information, you know, bit depth of eight. So it's eight bit precision, minimum and maximum values and so on. And there is one more thing I wanna note before I start. What you see here can be different depending on whether CH Control Manager is installed. This joystick does not require any drivers or software, but if you do install the CH Control Manager, everything works slightly differently. I'll show you this later on a different machine. Right now, I'm showing you what it looks like without CH Control Manager installed. This is the actual HID device. If CH Control Manager is installed, you don't see the actual device. You see a virtual device, even if you use what CH calls direct mode, which means that you are mapping that virtual device one-to-one -to, -one to the real device. But we'll get back to that. Let's start with the X and Y axes. The movement is quite light which can be good or bad, depending on what you want. There is some center play. And you don't really want that. Uh, as long as it's not showing up as movement, it's not that bad. I have seen it show up as movement on occasion. It doesn't seem to do that all the time though. It's uh, it's kind of on the edge of being picked up. As you can see, you know, and as I mentioned, um, precision is eight bits, which is quite low. And you'll also note that there's quite a bit of noise on the axes. You know how if I just leave it there, it's constantly on the edge of two values. There, there doesn't seem to be any kind of noise filter that can smooth out these variations, which is unfortunate because with that 8-bit precision, the difference between one value and the next value is actually kind of significant. The joystick uses opposing arms on dual gimbals. This type of design gives excellent precision for movement, so I can move on one axis and then I can move on the other axis without having massive changes on the one that I'm holding in place. If you have a ball and socket gimbal, which is more common on low end joysticks, this would want to go in a circle as I moved it, but you can move this in straight lines pretty well. However, uh, this design does come at a cost. So let me get this closer to the mic. So hopefully that got picked up. What you're hearing is the severe detent as this crosses center. Crossing the center with this joystick is awful. This is the effect of the gimbals switching which arm they're moving as you go from left to right or from forward to back. All joysticks that use this gimbal design have this issue. 
but the CH is doing nothing at all to mitigate it. There's no type of greasing or anything that would make this any more than just the raw feeling of plastic impacting on another plastic piece. So this is the worst that I have seen any joystick with this design handle that clunkiness. And the noise is the worst. It's just like, ugh. oh God. I hate the noise more than I hate the actual feeling of the detents. One other dislike, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this. And so there's zero, but no, I could still move it. So there's a decrease in the saturation zone on this stick and it's in hardware, which is a problem because basically it means that we hit the minimum output before we've reached the edge and there's no way it can send out a value that's beyond the range of the input report it's supposed to be giving. So it has no way of reporting that it's still moving. That saturation zone, it some people can like it. Some people want a little bit of saturation zone just to be absolutely certain that you've reached the edge. But that should be done at the direct input level. You should not have that in hardware. There's no way you can fix it if it's in hardware. You can't calibrate it out because it basically just doesn't report any movement. Basically, that's the limit of the x-axis right there. All that right there, that's basically non-existent as far as this device is concerned. So, uh, yeah, some, some problems. We have these trim dials. These let you adjust an offset to the value. So for example, if I adjust this one, note how the Y axis changes and now I can move it around like that. Now with the X axis, guess what? Now I got my movement back. How wonderful. So you may need to adjust these. And the thing is you're not supposed to be adjusting these for calibration purposes. This is meant to be used in game, so you can like force yourself to constantly put the nose of your plane up. But you might need to adjust these just because for calibration purposes, you may not be getting any values, any change in the input when you are at the edges. We also have a throttle dial. It's a very light movement. On my main gaming PC, I see a ton of jitter on this. If I just leave it in place and then I move on the X and Y, you can see uh, that's actually just noise. Let's get it so it's there's no noise on it. Yeah, there's no jitter on this PC. It's probably just a susceptibility to electrical noise, which varies from one USB chipset to another. So just keep that in mind. If you, if you see issues like that, this joystick just seems to be fairly sensitive to electrical issues. And finally, um, let's talk about the buttons. So button one is the trigger. The trigger is very low travel. So pretty much actuates the moment you press it. You can see it barely moves at all, which isn't necessarily bad. If you want something that's very realistic, that's not very realistic, but for gaming purposes, having a hair trigger, uh, you know, it can decrease your reaction time. Button two. Nice thing about all these buttons is there's so little play in them. Even this one, this is usually the worst button for play and it does have a little bit, but it's much better than you typically see. The tolerances seem to be handled really well. Button three. So watch what happens when I press this button. We got button three and button 17. Now what's this button 17? That's rather odd. Cause this is a 16 button joystick. Why is there a button 17? 
this is one of those differences that you will see if you are using CH Control Manager or not. Buttons 17, 18, and 19 actually report the mode that you are in when you're mode switching. So this is a mode switch button. So now if I press it again, because I'm in mode two, we'll see 18. I press it again, it's 19. And then go back to 17. So this is really meant to be kind of a private way of communicating which mode you're in that CH Control Manager can use to control what mode it is in in software. If you are seeing the CH virtual device that you will see if you use CH Control Manager, those three buttons are gone. So you're not meant to be using them. And one reason that I suggest that you do use CH Control Manager is to get rid of those buttons. Because if you have two buttons activating when you press that, it could be very confusing to some games when you're trying to bind it may pick the wrong one. Like say you're in Star Citizen and you're like, I'm gonna bind this to something and then you it picks up that button, like button 17, and you're only gonna get that activity every third time you press it. The LEDs also reflect the mode that you are in. It should be noted that the mode of the device is separate from the mode used in CH Control Manager. So you can make CH Control Manager use the same mode that this has. That's why we have those three extra buttons so that CH Control Manager can know what mode this is in. But you can also make CH Control Manager use the mode from a CH Pro Throttle, or uh, you can do it in a completely custom manner. If you use the Pro Throttle or a custom mode switching mechanism, these LEDs will not reflect what your mode is. They they always reflect the mode on the device, which you may just be ignoring if you're not tying that to what your CH Control Manager mapping has. And in fact, if we go back here and look at some of our details for the device itself, there's actually no outputs at all. So there's no command that can be sent to this that could tell this LED what to do. In the pinky button, button four. There's our four way hat, our second four way hat, and our third four way hat. And those are our 16 buttons. Everything after that is just the stuff that's meant to reflect the mode. And we have an eight way POV hat. So how do I summarize all of this? First, the positives, the buttons all feel really solid. Uh, they have great tactile feedback and there's plenty of inputs. 16 buttons plus an eight way hat. So that's 24 possible actions. You can get joysticks with more, you know, a Warthog has 19, so it's three more than this, but you'll also find many joysticks that have a lot less. And in my testing, I never found that I was lacking buttons on the joystick. The axes are a big mixed result though. I love having no axis bleed. And that really could have made this a major strong suit for this device. Most low end mass market products don't have this. If you are in Europe, you can find the Defender M5 Cobra and VKB just came out with a Gladiator, you know, but for the most common brands, you know, CH, Cytec, uh, Thrustmaster, the competitors are mainly using ball and socket gimbals. It's just the lack of any mitigation for that clunkiness when it crosses center that just kills it for me. And then the imprecision of the electronics is unfortunate as well. 8-bit precision is low enough to have an effect, although it will be a subtle one. I prefer to see 12-bit or higher. And so sadly, I think the axes actually come out being a weak point on this joystick. And I, I'm kind of frustrated with that because they could have been a strong point if they just went a little further with them. If, if this were modernized, if they used like a damping grease on the gimbals and switched to contactless sensors and up the precision, 
this could be dramatically improved. This is an example of how the device looks with CH Control Manager installed. Notice the interface reports a new name, Control Manager ID 0. This is actually not the same device, it's a virtual device, and the real device is hidden. Additionally, the axes are now calibrated before the HID input on the virtual device. There's no difference between the HID and direct input values. And finally, you can see that we now have only 16 buttons. The three buttons that report the mode are no longer present. Those are hidden by CH Control Manager. It is now listening to them privately for its own purposes so that it can control the mode that it has in software. All right, let's see how this looks on the inside. We're going to start with the grip. And there are six screws. Got two down here. And it's simple enough to disassemble. Right, the right side comes off. Oops. Right side comes off pretty cleanly. And there's our interior. All of the screws, by the way, are identical in length. They're identical screws, so they're interchangeable. I always like that. The switches are 12 by 12 millimeters, which is what I want to see. Not like the little 6x6 toys the X56 had. Within a particular line of switches, the 12x12s usually are anywhere from 2 to 10 times more reliable in terms of the, the cycles that they can handle. Soldering job looks excellent. The hat switch assemblies are also really nice looking. They look pretty burly. The trigger is really nothing but attack switch. And so the trigger simply rotates into it and it is depressed solely by the attack switch itself. That's different than what we see in many other triggers, which have an additional spring. This design is very simple. You know, they, they can't really give you a lot of travel. This is, this is only possible because it's such a low travel trigger, but the simplicity of the design means that it's probably not very likely to have any issues. I've not been able to identify exactly which tax switches these are, but I hear that they are rated to 10 million cycles which by the standards of consumer joysticks is superb. In more absolute terms, I don't really consider that superb. I just consider that what everyone should be using. It's really more of an embarrassment that you don't see everyone using switches that are rated to 10 million cycles because the difference in price over like this entire product, you've got four tax switches on this you're probably adding like 80 cents to the entire cost. 
there's no pot down here because there's no twist. And it looks like we could take off the grip entirely with these two screws. The wiring is nice and clean. And it goes to the base with this cable assembly. So they've twisted it and then sheathed it. All right, so oops, let's get one last focus on that if we can. Hmm. Yeah, there we go. One last view before I put this back together and then we'll look at the base. Okay, we've got that put back together. It's nice and simple. Now for the bottom, there are eight screws on the bottom. We have the four visible ones, but there's also four under the rubber feet. So to get those rubber feet off, I like to loosen them with my fingernail and then use a precision screwdriver. There you go. There's the screw. And that's all the screws. The back panel simply lifts right off. And here's our internals. So first thing I'll show you are the gimbals. So we have a gimbal and a gimbal for the Y and X axis. And let's see if we can give you a good view of how they work. You can see that center piece, which pushes each arm and that detent is caused by the impact that it has when it hits the other side as you're crossing center. Here we have the cable assembly from the grip, which then connects to the circuit board and then USB out. The pots are supposed to be rated for 2 million cycles, which is a lot for a potentiometer. I would rather see Hall effect sensors or magneto resistive sensors or something like that. However, these are gigantic pots. They're big and beefy. They look a lot better than what you would normally see for a pot. 
There's our throttle, just directly turns that pot. And then our trim wheels, we can see how they work. They offset how the pot sits so that it's pre rotated. the same tough industrial plastic it's what's used to make the gimbal you can see four screws in there we could use to detach the base completely the thing that I think this could really use is some grease like a good damping grease on this gimbal might really help that uh, that detent effect when you cross center. The Gladiator uses the exact same design. They use the damping grease on that, and it's much much improved compared to other designs like this. And it uses a very similar design. Otherwise, it's also it's basically the same plastic, same opposing rocker arm gimbals dual gimbals. Everything else is pretty much the same except for the fact that they added that grease. It just made it so much better. There's no grease at all, which is pretty unusual. You almost always see some greasing on this. And in fact, CH does not grease anything that I've seen in any of their products, which is kind of crazy. Well, there you go, guys. This is CH Control Manager, the software CH provides for all of their consumer flight gear. As you can see, the UI is quite old fashioned, just like the hardware, but in spite of that, it's quite easy to use once you understand it. I would classify all of its functionality as falling into three categories, calibration, virtualization, and programming. The first one is calibration. Any CH device can be calibrated from the CH Control Manager. We have a test slash calibrate button, and that produces a virtual device, which produces HID input that is pre-calibrated. You don't have to calibrate it at the direct input level. The second function is virtualization. I find that most flight gear software falls into two categories, programming and virtualization, and this is virtualization software. And what this means is that you aren't programming the device itself or its drivers. Uh, the device input is left as is, but an extra virtual layer is added, a, a virtual joystick, and you map physical inputs on physical joysticks to virtual inputs on virtual joysticks. So I, I make this distinction because it really helps in how you understand the software. Uh, CH has what it calls a mapping, and that might seem like confusing terminology until you realize that that literally is how you map physical to virtual joysticks. So you can see I have a basic mapping here with the fighter stick, the pro throttle, and the pro pedals. And I can pick any one of these. And you can see right now, each of these is basically a direct mapping, um, even though it's made to define a mapping for map mode. So the fighter stick maps to device one, and pro throttle to device two, and pro pedals to device three. The, the device index there refers to the virtual device. But I could make this map to device one, and I can make this uh, left toe brake on the pedals map to a slider axis on device one. So now that input goes to the same virtual device that all the fighter stick inputs go to. So you can mix all of these up. You could make them all one device if you wanted. Um, that would be very useful for older games that expect just a single game device, or you could just mix and match like I just showed you. And you can always switch very quickly between um, the mapped and direct mode. So we've got off mode, which just turns everything off. Direct mode will create a virtual device per physical device and maps everything one to one. And then map mode will activate your custom mapping. So a final function of CH Control Manager is programming. And I know I just said that it's not programming software, it's virtualization software. And while you don't program the physical device, you can program your virtual devices. Uh, so an example of this is uh, you could merge two axes. 
Uh, I do this when I use the CH Pro pedals with Elite Dangerous. Uh, Elite Dangerous does support a forward and reverse return to center thruster axis in addition to the typical throttle. So if you saw my X56 review, you know that I loved having that second analog stick for this function. I loved using it for uh, forward and reverse strafing. But we don't have that in a CH setup, but we do have a uh, set of pedals with toe brakes. And the only issue is that the toe brakes are two axes, not one. Elite Dangerous expects one. And each of those is returned to zero, not returned to center. But by mapping a virtual axis to the average of the inverse left and the regular right toe brake values, I can create a single merge return to center axis from them. And now I use the right toe brake to accelerate and the left to uh, go in reverse, you know, similar to how in a car you would use the right for accelerate and the left to brake. So as I mentioned earlier, I will be doing a complete review and tutorial on this software in future videos. And as such, I've not really demoed what I'm talking about, but I hope this gives you a sense for what you can do. The CH Control Manager software, I think is pretty powerful and it's a very rich product in its own right, which is why it deserves its own video. And I think it's a very strong, positive point for CH Gear. As always, I can only give you a conclusion as it applies to me. Uh, you may be looking for something different than I am. So I hope I've given you enough information that you can come to your own conclusions. But here is mine. It's really hard to place this joystick. It's almost aggressively mediocre. There's nothing that stands out bad about it. I mean, there, there are some things I pointed out that were, you know, less than perfect, but none of those is a fatal issue. The closest thing to a fatal issue would be the saturation zone problem. That is almost certainly a defect specific to this unit. I haven't heard of any complaints from other people with that same problem, but nothing stands out about it. Nice either. When I play with this joystick, it kind of just fades into the background, which isn't a bad thing. You don't notice any problems with it, doesn't get in the way, but it's not a joy to use either. It's really the basis, it's the starting point for a nice consumer grade joystick. It's not the end point though. If you took this and then you added Hall effect sensors and 12-bit precision, you would end up with something that I think is really great for the consumer market. The thing is, it is for the consumer market. It's, it's not a high-end product. Some people seem to have this idea it's a high-end product. It's not prosumer grade. It's not like the Warthog or a Black Mamba. It really is competing for just the average guy who wants a game controller. Some people seem to think this is like high-end sim gear. I mean, not that you can't use it if you're a dedicated sim player, but that's not really the level that this is being marketed to. I see some people will criticize the Warthog and boost the CH stuff in comparison by saying uh, the Warthog is metal outside, but it's plastic inside, referring to the gimbal. And there's certainly criticisms you can make of the, the Warthog. We'll do a review. And then they say the CH stuff is, it's plastic outside, but it's a metal inside. It's metal where it counts but it isn't. We saw today it isn't. Uh, it, some people think it has a metal gimbal. Clearly it doesn't. The plastic is, you know, it's a good plastic. Let's, let's not bash all plastics. This is a pretty tough plastic. It's not just cheap ABS, uh, but no, it's not at that grade that some people seem to think it is. It's kind of the Honda Civic of joysticks. It's solid, it's reliable, but it's pretty basic too. It doesn't have frills. It's not a luxury product. And that actually makes it a fantastic $50 joystick. It does not make it a good $125 joystick. $125, I think is just beyond what you could credibly ask for, for this product. If you have a 3d printer at home, you could make the same product. You can make it better. You can make a better version of this for under 40 bucks. At the $75 that I paid, that's kind of the very upper limit that you could credibly ask for for it. But again, I don't dislike it. It's just, I think it's a little overpriced. So 
let me know what you think. Uh, do you have a fighter stick? Do you like it? Uh, what do you think of the value proposition? You know, what did you pay for it? Uh, if you don't have one, uh, do you want one? Um, does this make you want one? Uh, let me know. Be sure to like this video if you liked it. Uh, if you want to see more of these teardowns, if you want to see more reviews, uh, and subscribe if you want to be notified of our future reviews because we've got a lot more coming. We've got the Pro Throttle, the Pro Pedals, uh, the CH Control Manager software. We've got the Cougar, the Warthog, the T16000M, the FCS HODUS coming up, uh, and more, a lot more. So uh, be sure to keep an eye out. Thanks a lot, guys.